Morning. Good to see you today. Oh, man, no one had coffee. All right. Okay. All right. If you sneak out during the message, I won't get upset as long as you're getting coffee. But uh, good to see you guys this morning. Some of us are tired because we did bike night last night. Did anybody serve at bike night last night? All right, cool. We'll tell you about that a little bit later. But let me ask you this question. When you drove in here this morning, did you guys see our A-frame signs as we drove in? Anyone here see them? Some of you? Some of you guys just drive right by. You don't even see them anymore. But they're on Santa Barbara, right? Right by the little miniature golf thing. And then there's another one. If you take that left, go all the way to the end. There's another one there. And then when you come just before you get into the parking lot. Well, I put them out there every morning because I have a pickup truck. They sit in the back of my pickup truck on the way in. I drop them off and I just set them up. It just, just takes a couple extra minutes. So a couple weeks ago, I'm driving in and uh, my daughters are with me. I think I got all three. I usually have Charlotte with me every time, but uh, a lot of times then Gwenny or, or Woody will be with me. And uh, I put out the first two signs. I drive to the stop sign and I look over and I see a police officer sitting there. So I definitely stopped, right? And I put my hands at 10 and 2. Is that right? Okay. And then I pull through, because I, and I go all the way across the street, pull over, because that's where I'm going to put my next sign. And I get out of the sign. As I'm pulling over, my daughter Charlotte goes, Poppy, can I run? So we have this little tradition. I don't know why she loves to do it. But when we park right there and I start putting out the sign, she takes off running to try to beat me to the entrance of the parking lot. So she runs across the street, and that's what she'll do, and she'll just take off. Of course, I'm putting out my street signs, and I'll either go slow or I'll go faster to catch up to her. So she goes, can I do it this time? And I said, sure. So I get out, and she take, gets out of the car, same side. She starts taking off, running down the street. So I'm like, okay. I put the sign out. I drive to the, the entrance, and I notice that the police officer's cruiser is following me now. And I'm thinking, okay, what did I do? Like, I, look, at, I'm a pastor. I did everything right. Like, there's nothing going to be wrong here, right? So I pull over to put out the next signs, and it's a woman officer, and she goes, hey, is everything all right? I'm like, yes, everything's fine. Why? What's going on? She goes, well, when you pulled over over there, I saw a child get out of your car and run down the street. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh, yeah, I see how that could be an issue maybe, right? It never dawned on me at the moment, right, how that might look to an outsider or a police officer that's just watching what's going on. And then I realized, Charles goes, that's why I asked you if I could do it this time. I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess you could. <laughs> You know, I have to admit, sometimes I make the wrong decision in the moment. I mean, to be honest, you know, it's kind of obvious, really, when you think about it. But in that moment, when Charlotte asked, I didn't even think about it. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I didn't think anything was wrong at all. And so once the officer told me uh, how it appeared, like it made perfect sense to me in that moment. It, but in the moment, I wasn't thinking about it at all. Because, in fact, it hadn't even crossed my mind. I was like, I didn't even think that that could be an issue because we do it every time. It's just my daughter riding, you know, running down the thing. And the truth is, every time I get in my car and I watch her run, I think, how many more days do I have to watch her run down the street? So I'm just going to enjoy this moment as I see her do that. But uh, the decision like that one really didn't have that big of an impact. I mean, she did drive all the way up to the front. She did question my daughter. I told her who she was. I said, yeah, you can talk to her. I mean, the setup team was a little bit on edge. Like, what's this cruiser doing here, right? But oh, it didn't really affect us all that much, except now we have a story to tell. But other decisions I've made had bigger consequences in my life. For instance, back in high school, my friend Scott, his parents had gone away on vacation. And so you know what that means, party, right? So we had a party at his house, and let me just say there was alcohol involved. Well, we're at his house one night, that night, and we're, everyone there, there's a lot of kids from school there, and a fight breaks out. And so now we're disturbing the peace. A neighbor had called the police. And so the police come and show up, and they say, you know, they start talking to everybody that's there, and they're trying to arrest a few people that are underage or whatever is going on, you know, and they come up to me, and they say, who are you? Well, I was a little inebriated. And so I said back to them, who are you? <laughs> that's all it took to be cuffed and thrown in jail overnight <laughs> until I sobered up. They're like, you're coming with us. And I'm like, uh-oh, okay. So, you know, be careful what you say when you've been drinking. We all know that rule anyway, right? But that one was a little bit more serious because I spent a night in jail. But there have been a lot bigger moments in my life where I've messed up. Maybe something I said 
or something that I've done, right, that had had consequences in my life. And they get me in big trouble. And there are some decisions in my life today that I've made in my past that I still either regret or that have affected my life today, right? You probably have made some too. Because we've all made mistakes. And we can look back and go, yeah, my life would be a little bit different if I hadn't done that one thing or if I changed or I did something different. I'm sure there are moments in life of decision that if it just went a different way, instead of the way that it went, the decision you made or whatever you did, that things would have turned out differently in your life, right? You're like thinking, yeah, man, I know some of those things happened to me. And we could have saved ourselves a lot of headache and a lot of heartache and maybe some of the pain that we caused our friends or ourselves or our family or whatever it was. We made a decision and we just kind of went with it. And then that decision in the end kind of bit us later on down the road. Or maybe immediately, right? And we could have avoided a lot of these consequences and hurt. But I guess the question is, how do we kind of avoid mistakes? Because we do all make them. We're just prone to make them. We're humans. And that's what it says when you make a mistake. And what do you say? Well, I'm just human, right? We're saying humans make mistakes. So how do we keep from messing up and save ourselves from the consequences that come sometimes from the bad decisions that we make? Well, maybe we can learn a few things today from the very first mistake that ever happened. I'm talking about when Adam and Eve made the first blunder and sinned. And whether you think this is just a story or you believe it's actual history, I mean, if we think about it in the grand scheme of everything that we've heard, this has got to be the biggest blunder of all, right? This is the biggest mistake of all history because it set everything in motion that has like now made life difficult. In fact, Paul, when he's writing, he kind of describes the consequences like this. This is what he says here. For we know that the whole creation, all of creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. He's like, from that point all the way till now, all of creation is going through childbirth pains. I mean, nobody here wants to go to childbirth pains, right? I mean, I, I saw my wife. I didn't experience it, but I was like, baby, it's all yours, right? <laughs> but everyone remembers, like, hey, yeah, that was really painful, and so I believe that we can learn a few things from the mistakes maybe that they've made that will help us avoid some of the mistakes in our own lives. And so we're in the series, Origin, How It All Began. It's an in-depth study of the book of Genesis. That's the first book of the Bible, if you're not familiar. It's the one that we open the page to number one, and there it is, Genesis. And it tells us a lot about how the universe was made. It talks about how the world was made, how life came to be, how you and I came to be on this planet. It's talking about all these original things that have happened. And today, we're going to see the very first sin, or what sometimes is called the original sin. Maybe you've heard it termed that way. It's the moment that Adam and Eve, who were created perfect, finally do something wrong. Because up until now, God has said everything has been good. Well, there was one day, a half a day, where it wasn't good, and that was when Adam was created without Eve. God said it's not good, but he fixes that because he brings Eve to him so that they can be together. And if you don't, if you... Uh, didn't listen to last week's message, I want to recommend it to you because I think it's really good for us to understand something about that. It was called the sex talk from God. You can look at it and check it out on our YouTube. Don't worry, there's no pictures unless you want them, but no, I don't have any there. But without this moment in history, the, the original sin, this moment of this fall, nothing else in the Bible is going to make sense. I mean, it, without chapter three that we're going to talk about today, is start today, if you go to page four, chapter four, Chapter 4 is not going to make sense to you without chapter 3 because Cain's going to kill Abel and we're going to be like, what happened there? I mean, we went from paradise to this guy killing somebody. What just happened? It just happened, right? It doesn't make sense. You know what else doesn't make sense? Israel, the people of Israel don't make sense without original sin. Jesus is not going to make sense without this chapter in our lives, without understanding what's going on here. It's an important chapter for you and I to kind of look at and understand because it explains so much about the bad that we experience in this world today. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth in two weeks, but it's affected our world. Like we just read, our whole creation is groaning and they're like, oh, we, we're under this heavy weight of the consequences of this one sin, of this one mistake. And so the biggest mistake of all started with Adam and Eve, and we're going to start now and check it out here. It's up on the screen. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. This is verse 1 of chapter 3. It just starts off with this serpent being there. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
So this scene opens up with this serpent who's talking to Eve. And the serpent was an animal that was created by God. So it wasn't just this thing that just magically appeared, but it was something that God had created, but it has now been taken over by what we call the devil, Satan, Lucifer. Okay, so he's inside of this animal and he begins speaking to Eve. And this word Satan that we use is a term that's called the deceiver or sometimes accuser or adversary. That's where the word Satan comes from. And so it's really a term that we've used for him because he's been the adversary of the whole world from this time forward. The first thing the serpent does is he questions what God has said. He comes on the screen, scene and the first words out of his mouth are this, did God really say? And he starts to plant a seed into Eve's mind. And this happens all the time in humanity. My son is a master at planting these seeds of questions. Now, like I said, last week, we, or last night, we did what was called bike night. So the city puts on this event where there are hundreds, literally hundreds, I don't even know if it's close to a thousand bikers that come and descend upon Cape Coral downtown. And there's a lot of vendors and there's even a stage. And we put up a tent as Faith Generation, our church, and we give out free popcorn and cotton candy. In fact, I've got a video here going on while wow, it's loud, but that's our tent. And we uh, give out free stuff and we talk to people. We let them know that we're a church here. There's my daughter and there's Megan and Joe and a bunch of other people. And the people love it. They just come. We gave out actually over 500 bags of candy. That's how these guys were working so hard, giving out cotton candies and stuff. And it was amazing. Did I say cotton candy? Bags of popcorn. That's what I meant to say. All right. Dawned on me. I mean, my mind is catching up to my mouth after the fact, if you noticed. But a friend of mine, when he saw that we advertised that we were going to serve at bike night or have a tent there, he said, John, I have some Harley Davidson paraphernalia. I've got some t-shirts and I've got these other things. Uh, I've got a, a GI Joe on a motorcycle that's kind of old. And he also had this train. No, 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 don't play. There you go. And you can see the train down the bottom and the GI Joe and the t-shirts hanging there. Well, when I brought them home, I actually brought two train sets home. There's a closer look at it there. It's a real... And Woody saw this train set, okay? This was on Friday. And he's like, Daddy, you got two of them. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, what are you going to do with them? Well, we're giving them away at bike night, this one and then the one in February. Did I ever have a train like, set like that? Well, yeah, one time you did, and you destroyed it. And Charlotte was there to remind him, yeah, we had one, but you guys beat it up. You weren't ready for that. And he's like, well, you know, I don't have one now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is for bike night. So, Daddy, can I have that bike that set, all right? This started on Friday, and he must ask me, I don't know, at least 15 times that night. The next day I get up, Daddy, what are you going to do with that train set? <laughs> can I have that train set? He keeps questioning me, questioning to the point where I'm starting to doubt whether I should give it to him or not, like, right? Do you understand that, what happens? You've had your children, right? And you've been in the position where they question you enough that you're at a point where you're just like, okay, I don't know why I'm keeping it. I've forgotten. You should just have it, right? <laughs> this is Satan's tactic to Eve, and it's his tactic to you and me. Why, why, why should you stay away from the tree? What did God say? Why did God say that? Right? He just keeps bugging him, pressing him, pressing him, pressing him. I'm not saying that my son is the devil or anything. I'm just saying it's in our nature. It's in our nature to keep questioning, 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 right? And so Satan wants to cast doubt about God's word in this very moment. Has God really said to you? He starts off. And he starts this question turning in Eve's mind. And Eve actually changes the word of God by adding, nor shall you touch it. Because when God gave the instruction, he didn't say that. He just said, you're not allowed to eat it. So already she begins to question it. And here's the first thing I want you to understand that's really going to help you today. Because I believe that we all struggle in these moments of making the right decisions. And if we can kind of get these points down today and remember them, I think it's going to help you the next time you come into a situation where you need to make the right decision. It says, uh, this is that it will always lead to problems when we substitute our word for God's word. Okay? It will always lead us to problems when we substitute our word for what God's word is. That's exactly what Eve begins to do. You see, Lucifer was a created angel. That's who he was. If you're wondering where he came from, but he was created in a timeline that we're not sure when it actually happened. And if you've been with us over the last five weeks, we started with the creation of the universe. And we don't know if the angels were created before that. 
They could have been created during that same time period when he created the heavens and the earth. Maybe that third heaven where God resounds and he creates a realm for the angels could have happened maybe on that first day. Or it could have even happened after because you know what? When man was created, we don't know how long it took for Adam and Eve to finally get to the tree and eat, right? It could have been a day, could have been a week, could have been a year, could have been a couple of years before they finally like, okay, it's time to eat. And I think it probably was a little while because Satan has to show up on the scene to kind of tempt them. So it could have happened in that timeline. We really don't know when it happened. But we just know that they were created, and they were created so that they could serve God. That's why he created the angels. And there are different types of angels that are described in the Bible. There's not just like a human, and we're all humans, male or female, but they're different, and they have different purposes, and they look differently. And only three of them that we know of are actually named in the Bible. We know Michael, we know Gabriel, who's kind of the messenger angel. Mike is an arch, Michael is an archangel, and he's kind of an angel of war. And then we have this one called Lucifer, and the truth is we're not even sure if that's his name. Because Lucifer comes from one area of Scripture where he was, basically it means day star. You were the day star. Why was he called the day star? Because he was so bright and shiny and brilliant because his whole body was adorned with precious stones, it says. So this angel was created really beautiful, but he's also what's called a cherub. And a cherub was a guardian angel. When Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden, they, God sets up cherubs to guard the Garden of Eden so they can't come back. And we think of cherub, you and I, we always thought, oh, that little baby angel, you know, that little chubby baby angel with little tiny wings, that little cute one? That's what we think of, oh, he's such a cherub, so little cute. But cherubs in the Bible are actually fierce, big creatures. I mean, they were like, you'd be kind of scared of them. But this one, Lucifer, is like the king of them all because he's made, created so beautifully. In fact, it says that his pipes or his organs so he could sing were amazing, so he could be a worship angel too. And it says, because we see pictures of God in the Bible sitting on his throne as if there is a throne room of God, that he himself, as we are told, was the one that covered the throne of God. He was the guardian over God. I'm like this angel. Can you imagine the importance this guy had? How beautiful he was, right? And if you want to know a little bit more about him, you can jot this down. You just go to Isaiah chapter 14 or Ezekiel 28, and he speaks about the king of Tyre and the king of Babylon in parallel, speaking of who this angel was. And so Lucifer was a privileged angel, and he was this mighty angel who covered God. That's my job. God, I got your back. Can you imagine God saying, get my back, right? This is the guy he has there. But pride begins to be found in him. And he decides at one point that his way is going to be better than God's way. In fact, in the area of Ezekiel 28, it says this, You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. I made you perfect, and you were blameless until wickedness was found in you. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So he's like, yeah, looking at everybody else, comparing himself to all the other angels going, yeah, I'm pretty awesome. I'm pretty great. And pride began to grow inside of him. And so he becomes a, an angel who wants to become God himself. Oh, this isn't good enough for me. I'm going to become a little bit better. You see, pride led him away from God. His pride led him to question God's motive, to question God's authority, to question who God was in his life. And that's exactly what he wants Eve to do. Eve, I want you to begin to question who God is in your life. He wants Adam and Eve to question God's love for him. He says, if, basically, if God really loves you, why would he withhold anything from you? I mean, that's the essence of his question. Did he really say you can't eat from this tree? I mean, why is God, what's so special? Why is he hiding this from you? I mean, if you've got a secret between two people, I mean, then there's something going on. Does he really love you? Does he really care about you? See, he begins to plant this seed because Satan is so subtle. He doesn't at this moment directly deny God's word. But what he does is he is, introduces this assumption that God's word is subject to your and my judgment. Think about that for a moment, right? Here's what God said, but now you and I get to judge whether it's right or wrong. You see, Eve buys this, what the snake is selling. Hey, the serpent tells me this, and she starts to buy it, and you can hear it in her response because he says, God said, she says, God said, you can't eat of it, you can't go near it, you can't even touch it, which is not what God said. So she's, think about it, you can hear it in the tone of her voice, you can hear in what she says, yeah, I'm starting to buy this. You know what he said, we couldn't eat it. We're not even supposed to touch it. Imagine that. 
God doesn't even want us near this tree. And so she adds a restriction to what God had said. And so her response becomes very revealing. God wants to withhold something from you and me. And she starts to buy into it. Maybe he doesn't love us the way we really thought he did. Maybe he comes to us and talks with us, but he's hiding things from us. And see, all of us will question God from time to time. You've probably done it. I know I have in moments of my life when things were very difficult. God, why are you letting this happen in my life? Really, God? I mean, I've been faithful to you. God, I go to church. I pray. You know what? I give money. God, why is this happening in my life at this time and in this moment? God, do you really love me? Because if you loved me, you would see the pain that I'm in right now or that I'm going through. And when we go through those moments, we begin to question God. In God's word, because God's word has told us certain things about him, but we begin to think things contrary to what his word has told us. And I think that if we are honest, that sometimes we do question God. And I'll be truthful with you too. There are good questions. There are honest questions that we can have from God. I'm not saying never question God, but here's the danger. When questioning God about what he's doing turns into questioning God's motive for what he's doing in our lives, that's where we begin to fall. You see, that's when it can lead us to question his character. And then we find ourselves in a very dangerous place because we wonder, does God want his best for me? Does God really love me? Does God really care of what I'm going through right now? Because when we begin to question his character, we begin to set ourselves up for the fall, just like Adam and Eve had been set up. You see, questioning God's word will always lead us away from God's salvation and God's protection. Satan wants to cast doubt about God in your heart today. Like, what is God doing in my life? Why is he allowing these things? Why? Because he wants you, Satan wants you, to leave God and actually follow him instead of God. When you cast doubts about something, it's the beginning of the journey away from something. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans when he's talking about man and humans moving away from God. He says, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. That's where it began. I began by exchanging the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served creature, uh, the created things, rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. You begin to question God and it'll start to lead you away so that you begin to follow and worship something else. And that's exactly what Satan was hoping for, is that they would do what he's doing. Satan is on a quest to be God. That's what he wants. And the very same temptation he's now going to use to try to suck in Adam and Eve to make the wrong mistake. Listen to what he says as we go on. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. You want to be like God? He's trying to hide this from you because you'll become like him. You see, the serpent moved to the next stage of his plan. He was successful in casting doubt into Eve's mind. Because she starts to go, yeah, 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 he doesn't even want us to touch it. So you can see the breakdown. But now he moves to the next thing. See, Eve's questioning God's word. She begins questioning his intentions. He begins, she begins questioning God's love for her. And now Satan is going to set the hook. God knows that when you eat of it, you're going to become just like him. You see, Satan makes the statement... And Eve decides who she's going to believe at this moment. Am I going to believe God's word or am I going to believe Satan's word? And this is the second point that's so important for us to understand. Is that everyone has to decide to to whose word we're going to listen. Every one of us has to decide this in our lives. And it's your freedom to make the choice that you want to choose. Who you want to follow. Who you want to listen to. Now, the angels were created, just so you know, for ministry, as ministering agents. That's what the Bible tells us. Paul writes this, Are not the angels ministering spirits sent to save those who will inherit salvation or serve those who will inherit salvation? Who are those that are going to inherit salvation? You and me. So God, in serving God, the angels are to serve us. They're to serve you and me. That's what they're created for, Right? So God sends them to serve us. In fact, he also writes this, listen to this, for he shall, God, shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. 
So we've heard this verse probably before, but God sends them to protect us, to watch over us. They're serving you and me to guide us. And I mean, this is a very comforting thought for most of us, not that we should worship the angels, but that they're there because God sends them to help us when we need help. And I think that's pretty awesome. But here's the problem. Satan doesn't want that position for himself. Wait wait a minute, God, you mean me? The angel that covers you. I, I mean, I am the anointed cherub that covers. You know, when they built the Ark of the Covenant, there are two cherubs that cover the mercy seat. And that is a picture of God's throne room. What we see in the temple and the tabernacle here on earth was a picture of what heaven is like. And these angels that were there right over the mercy seat, I'm one of them. But you want me to serve these, like, humans? You want me to serve them? You see, he has a goal. And that is to be like God himself. In fact, in Isaiah, he says, For you have said in your heart, God, God is writing about Lucifer here, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I'm going to be to the highest point, above the stars, above the north, as far as you can get, at the apex, that's where I want to be. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. See, he wanted to be God. I want to be him. And in his attempt to be God, he's seeking to draw all worship to himself, away from God and to himself. You see, he's going to convince a third of the angels to follow him. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how Lucifer, who's in the presence of God, decides he's going to move away from God, but he convinces all these other angels in heaven to follow him. A third of the angels actually follow him. And Satan is not trying to help Adam and Eve achieve their dream in this moment. What he's trying to do is use Adam and Eve to achieve his own dream. Follow me. Worship me. Turn away from God. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. You see, Satan wants to bring men down. His goal is to just get rid of us. Maybe he's jealous of humanity. Maybe he just wants to destroy what God thinks is pleasurable because I created you for my own good pleasure. And so God wants, he just wants to mess what God is doing. But he's never there to help you and me. And I don't think any of us, any of us really have thought that. Maybe you have. But if anyone here thinks in some shape or form that Satan is worth worshiping or that he's worth following, he doesn't want anything good for you. In fact, Jesus, speaking of him, says this, then the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Satan comes to steal things from your life. He's come to kill you, and he wants to destroy anything of value in your life. That's all he wants to do. There's the three things. That's what he comes for. And so Satan showing up in the garden is not there to help Adam and Eve. He's not there to advance them in any sense or in any way. You see, Satan says to man, you want to be like God? I can help you there. I can give you a hand there. So he lies to them. But in one sense, what he said was actually true. The day you, you eat of it and you're going to be like God, right? You'll know the difference between good and evil. You see, that part was true. That part was true. They became aware of what was good and evil, but the only problem is they didn't become God. They didn't be even become like God because we're their descendants. Do you feel like you're God? I mean, some, you're, don't elbow your husband, okay, wives? Like, right? We, we didn't become God, and that's the problem. That's the trap of all temptation is that it promises something that it will actually never deliver on. Adam and Eve are going to find this out, and the problem is that they wanted to be God, but they couldn't become him. And the truth is, Satan will not become God because he's not God. And you and I will not become God because we're not God. And no matter how much we want to, and no matter how much we eat of a magic fruit or take some magic beans or do something else, it will never make us God because there is only one God. And so maybe at this moment, it's a good time to ask ourselves this question. I put it up on the screen. It's in your outline. But if we are not listening to God's word, think about this for a moment. Whose word are you listening to? If we're not listening to God's word, then whose word are you listening to in your life? Because this is going to tell us so much about whom we serve and how our decisions are made and really what's going to happen when we make those decisions. You see, we all listen to someone's word. I mean, if it's not God's word, then maybe it's a friend, maybe it's your parents. And I'm not saying don't get advice, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is when we take those words or your own opinions or Satan's words, right, it's not God, who we're listening to sometimes. Sometimes we're following after something and God's like, hey, uh, 
you shouldn't be listening to that serpent right now because I've already kind of given you my word on what to do here. And Satan's trying to get in there and destroy it. There's this point in Jesus' ministry, and it gets very challenging for the people who are following him because his sermons get a little bit more like, hey, guys, we really got to put, we really got to start following God. Really, I, I do a bad job of, talk, of being Jesus. I just want you to know that in my preaching skills here, right? So, but he starts to really press into them. In fact, he just fed them all, 5,000 people with food, and they follow him. And then he's like, hey, you guys are just following me for the food. But really, I'm here to talk to you about following God. And so a lot of them are like, man, this is really hard to understand. In fact, his disciples come up to him and they're like, hey, Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but like what you're saying is really difficult for people to hear right now. They're, they're not getting it. And, and in fact, because they're not getting it, a lot of them are walking away. And Jesus looks at them and he says something interesting. He says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, he says, do you want to go away too? And Peter responds to him, Lord, to whom will we go? For you have the words that give eternal life. You see, Peter kind of recognizes something is that if you're not getting your word from God, if it's not his, then you're going to go somewhere else. He says, but the problem is nobody else has words that offer eternal life. So I think I'm just going to stick with you was his choice. You see, everyone has a choice to make. And I think it's a question that we have to ask ourselves from time to time. If I'm not going to follow God's word in this matter in my life, in this area that challenges me, whose word am I actually going to listen to? Am I going to listen to my opinion? Am I going to listen to what I feel should be right or what somebody else is practicing? Or am I going to decide that I'm just going to follow God? You see, all of us have the choice. And in fact, Adam and Eve have that choice. And here now they're going to make that choice. It's up on the screen. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. You see, the more I think Eve sat there looking, having this conversation, just looking at that fruit, I mean, it just became more and more attractive. You know, it's hard for us when we know we can't have something, when we think about it and sit there. I mean, she shouldn't have been by the tree, but she's there by the tree looking at this fruit. And I think it just became more and more desirable. And she got to a point where she forgot God's character. So she's standing there and she starts to think, well, why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I? Because she forgot about what God said. She forgot about what God wanted for them. And so she saw no reason not to eat it, and she gives in. And so this is the last thing that would be important for us to understand, is that is God's word will protect you and guide you when you follow it. You see, God wanted to protect them. He wanted to guide them, but they had to listen to it. You see, after God's motive is questioned, and wondering whether God really wanted the best for her, Eve had abandoned all of God's protection. Think about it for a moment. Because God's protection is in his word. It's in there for you and me to guide us. But if we get rid of his word, then the only thing that stands between you and a decision is temptation. And that's where she found herself. She's looking at the fruit. It's like, wow, it looks really good. Man, it's so desirable to eat, right? It looks like it tastes great. And there's nothing left for her in that moment but temptation. And the same thing is going to happen to you and me. When we remove God's word from what we know about a certain topic or a certain thing in our lives, if we take it away, the only thing that stands between you and me is now temptation. In fact, the, John, the apostle, he writes about this struggle that happens and that this temptation that comes from the world, listen to what he says, for everything in the world... Okay? You remove God's word, everything in the world the, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world, the world and its desires pass away. But whatever God does, the will of God lives forever. But whoever does the will of God, excuse me. See, the world constantly offers temptations. And just leave that up on the screen for just a moment. But she saw that the tree was good for food. That was the lust of the flesh. It's food. It could satisfy me. I'm hungry, right? The lust of the flesh was there in that moment. And she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. The lust of the eyes. I would desire that. I'd like to have it. I've never seen that before. I want to oh, grab this. I want to hold it, right? And then she says it was desirable to make one wise. I don't know how she detected that, but she's looking at the fruit and she's like, yeah. 
This is going to make me wise. The pride of life. The same three things that John talks about right here. Because when we strip away the word of God, all those things are going to become more and more amplified in our life and in the area that we're struggling in. You see, we need God's word to inform us. Because if we don't have God's word to inform us, that's where all of our protection is. You see, if we face the world without God's word, it will lead, word, it will lead us to our downfall. I mean, we're going to forget our purpose. We'll forget God's will for us. We'll forget that God loves us. We'll forget why God ever even said that we shouldn't do whatever it is. And the truth is, none of us really has the power to withstand temptation. I mean, probably each and every one of us already know that from our lives. I mean, the story that we're reading right now is, is a picture of the, how man is, can't do it. We can't resist temptation forever. You may go, yeah, I resisted at that time. Oh, I did it a third, a fourth, a fifth time. But over time, we're going to fall. Because when you only have temptation in your life, you're not going to be able to withstand it. And that's the importance of God word, God's word in our life. Once we question God's word, we're prepared to, to then deny his word and then believe Satan's lies. And I guess the question we have to, have to ask ourselves today is what, what are we believing? What are we believing in your life today? What's the thing that's going on in your life that you need to interject God's word to come in in that moment and kind of save you from whatever it is that you're going through? You see, if we look back on every bad mistake and every bad decision we made, it's because we followed another word, someone else's word, our own idea instead of God's. Because when we followed God's word, somehow, some way, it worked out. The deception of Satan was under is that he could be like God, self-existent. And that's the same temptation that we have. I can be self-existent. I don't need you, God. I can make my decisions on my own. You know, every one of you who's had a child or have been a child, we've all been there, right? We all understand this. Why? Because at one point we said to our parents, I can't wait till I'm 18 and I can make my own choices and I can make my own decisions. And the truth is, we're all going to get to that point, but it doesn't mean we're going to make good decisions, does it? Because if we want to make the good decisions and the right decisions, then we need to have God's protection through his word in our life. If I could sum up the whole Bible in one sentence, it would be this. Believe God at his word. The whole sentence. What about Jesus? Yes. What about, what about Abraham and sacrifice? Yes, it all encompasses that. In fact, if you go to the Old Testament, someone might ask, how is the Old Testament saint saved? How is someone saved in the Old Testament? You know how they were saved? Believing God. If God said, go sacrifice, and that would cover your sin, then that's what he meant. In fact, we know this because when God talks to Abraham, we're going to get to this later as we get through the book of Genesis, but he says this, that Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is before Jesus came. Jesus is important because Jesus is the only way we are made. It's the mechanism by which we are made right before God. So I'm not denying the importance of Jesus. But what I am saying is if you look at the Bible, everywhere God is asking us to believe him. Every moment he's saying, Can you, will you believe me? Will you do this? Will you trust me? In fact, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, come up to Jesus and they're like, hey, what can we do to do the works of God? I put it on the screen for you guys. What can we do, right? And Jesus said, the work of God is to what? Believe in the one whom he sent. Believe. Everywhere, God wants us to believe him. That's the whole story of the Bible in a nutshell. Is if we believe him, we trust him, put it into action, our lives are going to turn out right. If you want to avoid the mistakes that you've been making in life, just follow what God has said. Because that's what it's all about. And the question we have to leave here this morning, today, is asking this question to ourselves. Whose word am I going to believe today? Because each and every one of us, I myself included, are going to be confronted at different times in my life. They're not, it's not over. It's still going to happen. And we have to decide what voice we're going to listen to in that moment. Whatever it is, whether it's with your family, whether it's at your job, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's with, you know, whatever situation you're going through in life. God's going to ask the same question. It's going to come up every single time. And if we want to avoid the fall, if we want to avoid the mistake that Adam and Eve made, 
then we'll go with God's word and trust him no matter what, no matter what it seems, no matter what it might cost us, whether we believe God's in it or not, continue to believe and continue to move forward. And that's how you'll change your life. And that's how you'll make your life the life that God wanted for you. Let's pray. God, it isn't always easy to choose you. I think in a religious setting, like a church, it's easy for us to say, no, 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 I always follow you, God. No, I always put God first. But the truth is, if we were to examine our lives, I can't say that's true. <laughs> God, if we truly believe that you love us and that you have the best for us, help us to walk in it no matter what. Because i got to be honest, God, there were moments where I didn't feel you were there for me. There's moments where I didn't feel that you had my best in mind. But when I look back, I know you did. I guess that's what faith is about, God. Me trusting you, even when I don't feel it and don't see it. So God, help us all to have more faith. To have the faith to follow you in this circumstance I'm going through right now, in the circumstance I'm going to go through tomorrow, whatever else you have. So God, help us to be just like Christ, to follow you, to do things your way. Lord, to change our lives, but to change the lives of those around us. God, help us to do that, because that's what I want you to do. Thank you, Lord. And today, I just want to say to you, when I said that Jesus is the mechanism by which we are made right by God, it's because of his sacrifice on the cross that we're able to be forgiven for our sins. Because he died for every single one of them. So God came down, looking forward. We're going to learn about this next week. Looking forward into history, going, you know what? I'm going to do something where I redeem all of these mistakes that started with Adam and Eve to the moment we are right now and even into the future. I'm going to come and I'm going to be the ultimate sacrifice and die for every sin that was ever created and ever made. And he says, all you have to do is believe in me, receive it. You don't do a bunch of works. You just have to believe. But you really have to believe. You see, if you're willing to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my heart, be my God. Not Satan, not me, not somebody else. Be my God. Be the Lord of my life. He will come in and he will save you. He will change your eternity forever. If you're wondering how that happens, all you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask him. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And I'm just going to ask everybody just to pray this out loud. Dear God, I invite you inside to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Of all I've done wrong, I decided today to follow you, Jesus, on this day forever. I'm yours in your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.